Welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, a podcast shared by David Roylance. This podcast is dedicated to guiding you to completely eliminate the discontent mind and the suffering it causes by attaining enlightenment. Learn and practice the teachings of Gotama Buddha that will guide you to fully attain a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. To support this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha or visit buddhadailywisdom.com where you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online learning resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Now, here's our teacher to share more. Sawadikap. Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today we're doing meditation together. This is our time to come together for a guided meditation. We typically do breathing mindfulness meditation or loving kindness meditation. And today is loving kindness meditation. So I'd like to welcome all of you, whether you're tuning in for the first time or you've been joining regularly, we're live streaming out to Facebook, YouTube, and Zoom, and some other places as well. We're also recording this for our podcast so that you have the opportunity to replay this and learn again and actually meditate along together. And if you happen to ever miss class, you can always access the recordings. So I'd like to welcome all of you and invite you to join us for meditation. The loving kindness meditation is meant to address the anger, hatred, and ill will in the mind. I'll be guiding you guys in this loving kindness meditation where we'll start out with a chant. Then we'll go into breathing mindfulness meditation for just a short period of time to kind of clear the mind. Then we'll do loving kindness meditation for an extended period of time where I'll be guiding you throughout that meditation. Then we'll go back to breathing mindfulness and back to chanting. And at the end of class, we'll open up to any questions that you might have related to the path to enlightenment and these teachings that I share. When we do the loving kindness meditation, I'll be starting with these affirmations on the out breath, where as you breathe in, but then on the out breath, you will repeat the affirmation that I say, you'll repeat that in the mind. So the affirmation will be, may I be peaceful. And then the next out breath, may I be safe. And then the next one is, may I be well. And then the next one is, may I be free of all discontentedness and the suffering it causes. Once we cultivate loving kindness or this active goodwill, this genuine interest in seeing all beings be well and cultivating that for yourself, then we'll move out to the next ring and we'll do a little bit wider ring and wider, 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 all the way until we get to all beings. You'd like to make sure you don't leave out any beings whatsoever. And you should customize these rings in your practice based on the individuals whom you currently have loving kindness for. And you're looking to cultivate that and encourage that, support it, not allowing it to fade. And also people who you really struggle with and where you actually have maybe perhaps anger, hatred, and ill will, or maybe some of the lesser versions, like maybe some annoyment or irritation, or even just the slightest dislike. Because an enlightened being isn't going to have dislike towards any being whatsoever. They're not going to be annoyed or irritated around anyone whatsoever. They're going to not have dislike for any particular person or group of people. And the way that you get to that is through cultivating the mind in meditation, using loving kindness meditation, and then practicing loving kindness through your intentions, your speech, and your actions. So here we're going to have an opportunity to cultivate the mind in meditation. And then afterwards, I'll open up to any questions that you guys might have related to these teachings. All right. So if you guys would like to join for meditation, you can just go ahead and take a position. It's usually in the seated, lying, or standing positions. The walking position isn't done for loving kindness meditation. You should get your lower body comfortable and the hands and arms should be comfortable. If you're sitting on the floor, that means you probably have a cushion under your rear with your legs lightly crossed. This opens up the hips, the knees, and the ankles so there's not any real tension in those joints. The hands and arms, you can put your right hand over your left with your thumbs together and then place that into your lap. That's going to allow your hands and arms to be comfortable and relaxed. 
If this doesn't feel comfortable for you, you can put your palms on your thighs, on your knees, palms up. There's all these different options. You can even use the armrest of a chair if you're sitting in a chair with armrest. Essentially, your hands and arms should be completely relaxed along with the lower body as well. The upper body should be erect. This keeps the mind attentive and alert during the meditation because this is a dedicated, active, purposeful training session where you're eliminating certain unwholesome qualities from the mind and you're cultivating certain wholesome qualities in the mind. So you would like your mind to be attentive and alert as you're actively training it in meditation. Next, you would like to just close the eyes and start breathing in through the nose and out through the nose, taking nice, gradual breaths. I'm gonna do some chanting. You're welcome to join along with the chants if you know these. If not, you can just hang out here with the breath and then I'll be back with guidance after the chants. Arahant Sawakato Sawakasanko Sankang Namami Napmore Sapakawato Arato Samasamputasa Nap more sa pakawato Arato sama samputasa Nap more sa pakawato Arato sama samputasa Iti piso makawa arahan sama samoto wicacaranang samuno sakatoro kawito. Anu tero puri sa dama sati sata tawa manu sanang puto pakewati. Okay, you should be breathing in through your nose and out through the nose. Here you're just establishing the breath, taking a nice inhale naturally through the nose, experiencing the full breath, and then a nice exhale out through the nose, experiencing a natural exhale. Breathing in and out. Breathing in and 
out. Your breath isn't going to necessarily match up to the guidance that I'm providing because this is your practice. I'm just here as a guide. So wherever you get to the next inhale, breathing gradually through the nose, experiencing the full breath. And whenever you get to the exhale, exhale out through the nose. Breathing in. In, out. Breathing in. In, out. With the breath well established, start fixating the mind on the sound of the breath or the sensation of air moving over the skin into the nose. The breath is the present moment. Fixate the mind on the breath, the present moment. Breathing in. In, out. Breathing in. In, out. With the mind fixated on the breath, the present moment, whenever you observe that the mind is off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. No need to label the thought, no need to observe it, or try to figure out where it's coming from. Just wherever you observe that the mind is off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. Breathing in. In, out. Breathing in, in, out. I'm going to be quiet now and let you do this work of breathing mindfulness meditation, focusing on the breath, cutting off and letting go anytime the mind is off the breath. Then I'll be back with some guidance for loving kindness. You have nowhere to go. There's nothing to do. No one needs you right now. This is your time to focus on the breath. Breathing in. In, out.
Continuing to breathe in through the nose and out through the nose. Repeat these affirmations on the out breath. May I be peaceful. May I be safe. May I be well. May I be free of all discontentedness in the suffering it causes. May my parents and grandparents be peaceful. May they be safe. May they be well. May they be free of all discontentedness in the suffering it causes. May my brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, and cousins, all my extended family, be peaceful. May they be safe. May they be well.
may they be free of all discontentedness and the suffering it causes. May my children, nieces and nephews, all be peaceful. May they be safe. May they be well. May they be free of all discontentedness and the suffering it causes. May my friends, co-workers, and associates all be peaceful. May they be safe. May they be well. May they be free of all discontentedness and the suffering it causes. May all beings, no matter where they reside, be peaceful.
may they be safe. May they be well. May they be free of all discontentedness in the suffering it causes. Now go back to breathing mindfulness meditation, focusing on the breath. Breathing in and out.
ಸಖ್ಯವನ್ಹಿವಾತೆ ಸವಖ್ಯವತೋ ದಾಮಂಗ ನಮಸ ಸುಪಥಿಪನೋ ಸಾಖೋ ಸಂಘ ನಮಿ ನಪ್ಮೋರ್ಹಸ ಭಗವತೋ ಸಂಸುತ ನಪ್ಮೋರ್ಹಸ ಭಗವತೋ ಆರತೋ ಸುಮಸುತ ನಪ್ಮೋರ್ಹಸ ಭಗವತೋ ಆರತೋ would like to gradually make your way out of meditation as you guys are making your way out of meditation i'll just remind you of a few details about loving kindness meditation it's important to remember that this meditation is not to send loving kindness to others or somehow change others through your meditation instead this meditation is to change your mind This isn't a prayer wishing that somebody to be peaceful or to be well. Instead, you're transforming your mind or you're rewiring the mind, helping it to eradicate any kind of anger, hatred, ill will, and those lesser versions so that now when you're around people, you can then function with more love and more kindness through your intentions, your speech, and your actions. So this meditation is training your mind. It's like filling up your gas tank so that now you can go out into the world and now you can practice being loving and kind, having this genuine interest in seeing others be well and practice active goodwill while you're interacting with people through your intentions, speech, and actions. And that's where your real practice comes in. Because if you were only meditating and that's all you did, and then you went outside and you were using wrong intention, wrong speech, wrong action, for example, then you're going to find it's very difficult and very challenging in the world, very much a struggle. Because if you're putting out harshness or aggressiveness or other kind of unwholesome mental states, if you're functioning in unwise ways about your intention, speech, or actions, then that's going to come back to you. So this is transforming your mind so that you can now function in more loving and kind ways. So what I'd like to do is open up to any questions that you guys might have related to either loving kindness meditation or really any aspect of the path to enlightenment. You're welcome to put those into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can raise your hand electronically and ask any questions or follow-up questions directly. Hello, teacher. So if uh, uh, loving kindness meditation is a way to eliminate anger and hatred from the mind, so the question is that Why does the mind cling to these painful 
uh, feelings or painful memories. So, I mean, it's, it makes sense that the mind clings to pleasant feelings. It experiences some uh, uh, pleasure, but why does the mind clings or holds on to these painful feelings? The mind is craving permanence. It doesn't like change. It doesn't like impermanence. So it's clinging because of its craving for permanence. It doesn't know anything else, but it wants permanence. And then the reason why these feelings are there is because of various experiences a person has had over the course of their life in previous lives as well. There's these mental objects like ill will that are formed in the mind. And when this mental object of ill will is in the mind, then it can motivate and encourage unskillful conduct that's harsh and bitter and aggressive and hostile. And the mind is just clinging and clinging and clinging. It's holding on to these mental objects. It's holding on to these feelings. It holds on to perceptions. It holds on to so many things that it doesn't know how to let go. It hasn't been trained to let go because of its ignorance or unknowing of true reality. The mind, oftentimes when there's conceit there, it thinks that everyone else is the problem. And it looks at everyone else as being the problem. It almost feels justified in its anger because of its wrong view and not understanding that it's causing its own discontent feelings. It has this ignorance, this unknowing of true reality. It has this ignorance, this ill will, all these other mental objects. It thinks that I'm perfect. Everyone else is the problem. It's just unknowing of true reality. It doesn't know what it doesn't know that these feelings are being created by its own mind. So it gets to a point where it almost feels justified in its feelings towards others because it thinks that other people are causing it to be angry or hostile or aggressive. And instead, when you get wisdom, you can understand that you're causing all these feelings yourself in what's causing these problems and then you can antidote this and fix it through training the mind well on zoom we have a question from max he writes is there a way of arising loving kindness in the mind outside of loving kindness meditation you can apply right effort and arise loving kindness but if you weren't combining it with the loving kindness meditation then you haven't cultivated the mind in meditation it would be very difficult to be able to do that outside of meditation so these two things combined is what allows you to apply right effort to apply loving kindness so if you're cultivating loving kindness in meditation and you understand that loving kindness is the antidote or the exact opposite of anger, hatred, ill will, those lesser versions like frustration, irritation, annoyance, dislike, then in daily life with your mindfulness, your awareness of mind that you've cultivated, wherever you see anger, hatred, ill will, frustration, irritation, annoyance, dislike arise, right away you should apply right effort to then bring in the loving kindness where you see you're being harsh or bitter or even just thinking about being harsh and bitter towards another person then right away you cut that off and say nope i'm going to not allow the mind to do this i'm going to practice loving kindness being interested in seeing this being be well and if that means that you stay quiet or maybe you cut off where you're talking mid-sentence or you cut off your thought about the words you're about to say you cut that off, you restrain the mind and you pull it back. And now you arise this loving kindness through right effort. And then you put together some words that are loving and kind, or you just remain quiet. So if one is unable to cultivate loving kindness toward certain people, does this necessarily mean that there is still uh, some hatred and will in the mind? Yes, an enlightened being will have no hatred, no anger, no ill will, not even the slightest irritation or annoyance, not even the slightest dislike towards another person. They will instead just understand that everybody is working on their journey, put it that way, that not everybody is necessarily on the path, but everybody's in their own life. Everybody's struggling unless they're enlightened. They're struggling with their own craving, anger, and ignorance. And 
if there's something that you disagree with that somebody's doing, okay, you disagree with their intentions, their speech or their actions, but that doesn't mean they're a bad person. This is just impermanence, that you're not going to agree with the way that everybody functions in the world. But if you're craving to agree with how people function, then when they don't function the way you want them to function, then that's where anger is going to arise in the mind or this dislike is going to arise in the mind because you dislike the way that they're functioning in the world because there's this craving in there wanting everybody to function a certain way. When you don't get that, then the anger is going to arise. So when you get rid of this craving and you realize that it's not possible for everybody to function the same way because of the universal truth of impermanence, people are going to do things that you disagree with. That's not the problem. The Universal truth of impermanence is not the problem. The problem is that the mind has craving and it wants everybody to function a certain way. So where you see people doing something differently, then you need to just accept that that's what they're doing and you disagree with it. You can talk to somebody about it, but you would need to do that with right speech. I can give you an example of this that, you know, I teach at this temple and the classroom that I teach in just outside the door there's two rooms where sometimes visiting monks come and they sleep in these rooms. It's kind of like a temporary place for them to sleep. And these monks in the hallway that connects the classroom where I teach in these rooms where they sleep, they will oftentimes put trash in trash bags. And then it's like food, trash, and sometimes the bags leak and they get sticky substances all over the floor. And then all these ants start coming into the hallway. They don't come into our classroom because we don't have food in there, but they come into the hallway and it looks very messy in the hallway with all this trash. And I've seen it there many times and I've tried to talk to the monks once or twice, but I wasn't able to speak enough Thai to explain it to them. And they're not learning this from whomever they're learning from that, you know, it's important to stay clean and cleanly. The Buddha even taught this too, but they're not learning that for some reason. And they're fairly young monks, you know, they're in their 20s, early 20s. And when I see them, I don't dislike them. I don't hate them. I just know that they haven't learned this yet. They're young. And when I was young, I probably didn't take out the trash very much either. I did exactly the same things as them. So I just have loving kindness and compassion for them. And there was a period of time where I just left the trash there and just let all the ants come in. And I imagine the ants were going into their room because for a period of a few weeks, I noticed the trash was all gone. But now the trash is coming back again. And I saw like two or three bags out there this weekend. And then myself and some of the students, we just took the trash out because I actually thought that the monks had left and we just took it out and we we took it out to the trash bin and it was there for so long that we thought that they weren't even staying in those rooms anymore. But then when we took it out this weekend, I noticed on Monday morning that the monks were there again and they started collecting up the trash again. And I was like, oh, okay, well, they're going to collect up trash again. You know, this hallway is going to have trash in it sometimes because people are putting trash in the hallway. I would like it for it to be clean, but it can't be clean permanently. So I don't have a craving for this hallway to be clean. I have an interest for it to be clean. I I would like for it to be clean. I have a, a goal or an objective, but I know that I'm not the only one that uses that hallway. So there's going to be occasions where there's trash and other things. So now I'm waiting until I see them and I have an opportunity to talk to them. I typed out a message on Google Translate that speaks in Thai and I played it for my wife so that it says, you know, can you please take out the trash every two or three days? Otherwise, ants are going to come. You know, I guess they don't understand this. And I let my wife listen to it to make sure Google Translate was translating it properly and it was nice and polite. And she said, yeah, that's exactly polite. That's find the way it's translating it. So now I kind of know, even though Monday, this was three days ago, that the trash is coming back. I'm just patiently waiting until I see them and they're outside of their room or I'm in the hallway. And it might not be for another two, three, four, five weeks before I see them. But I would like to kind of educate them about this. And then even when I do 
that. They probably still won't take the trash out. I'll need to kind of guide them a little bit more. But when you do this patiently and you understand gradual training, gradual practice, gradual progress, and you do it politely, kindly, friendly, and respectfully, they're more likely to actually do this. In all actuality, it's not bothering me at all. It's not hurting me at all because we're all the way inside the classroom. And when we come out, yeah, it's messy. There's trash. There's ants and stuff like that. And I would just like it to look nice for the students who come. It would be nice if this hallway looked looked nice and presentable. But you know what? This is kind of the way things are sometimes in places. There's people who don't take out the trash. So I disagree with their action. I disagree that they allow trash to accumulate for a month or two and the ants come and there's sticky stuff all over the floor. But I don't hate them for that. I don't have anger for that. I don't have frustration or ill will or any kind of annoyance or even the slightest dislike. It's just a disagreement. It's just that I choose to conduct myself differently at this point in my life. At other times in my life, maybe I conducted myself that way. I'm not sure. I always remember being very clean and cleanly, even when I was a child. But these people, for one reason or another, haven't learned that as they were growing up. And now I'm in a situation where I can potentially help them to learn and help them understand. And if they're receptive to that learning, then wonderful. But if they're not and they ignore it or they're not interested in being cleanly, then okay, well, the hallway will just be dirty when they're there. They're not permanent. They're only there a few months, a year, I think. And really, it's truly affecting them the most because the ants are coming in, and I think they're probably going into their room and stuff like that. So in these situations where you see things that you would rather be different than they are, usually what the mind will do in the unenlightened state is it'll have craving. It'll want things to be a certain way, and then if it gets that, it'll get happy. And if it doesn't get that, it'll be angry. And then our conduct will be unskillful and be aggressive and hostile and bitter towards those people. But now you've just ruined your relationships. Instead, you can have this goal, this objective, this interest for the hallway to be clean, and then you can politely and patiently and respectfully try to perhaps talk to people and guide them and help them to make better decisions. But ultimately, if they don't choose to learn and make better decisions, then that's just the way it's going to be. And just know that the trash is impermanent. These people are impermanent. It's not affecting you. But instead, you can try to pursue the goal, the objective, the interest. But if it doesn't work out, then it just doesn't work out. Now, if it was my child or my son, it would be different, right? I'm going to ensure that he learns that he needs to take out the trash and he can't leave trash around and he needs to pick things up. But these particular individuals, they must not have learned that growing up and that's why they're functioning that way now. So depending on your role, you will have more or less influence. With my son, I have a lot more influence. With these monks, I don't have as much influence. But in either situation, if your mind is angry and hostile, you're not going to be successful in guiding your children or guiding somebody else like these monks that are at the temple. So by me remaining calm, I can then be polite, kind, friendly, and respectful. I can use my wisdom to try to talk to them and incentivize them to take out the trash. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it comes back to their decisions and whether or not they choose to do it or not. You know, if they don't, that's fine. It's no big deal. You know, it's been there for two months already. It's not going to change my life in a major way, but it would just be nice if they kept the hallway clean so that as visitors are coming, that it would, you know, look a lot more presentable. So we'll see what happens. But when you have anger in your mind, you can't do these things. You can't be patient. You can't be kind and polite and friendly and respectful. And this is where we damage our relationships and then we have difficulties in life. Well, you mentioned that you may disagree with them. So Max is asking, disagreement is not a form of judging. It is just a different idea of how things are more ideal to be. Exactly. I'm not judging them. I'm just saying, you know, I wouldn't choose to leave trash out in the hallway like that for extended periods of time but they are choosing to do that. This is the way that they have conducted their life. 
and they've had different experiences than I've had, it doesn't mean that my way is right and their way is wrong or that their way is right and my way is wrong. It's just that I disagree. And what I would like to do in the message that I typed out is I said, you know, can you please take out your trash every two to three days because otherwise ants come. Nowhere in that message am I saying, you know, you're wrong for what you're doing. This isn't supposed to be this way. You know, how dare you do this? That would be judgmental. And now coming from a position of arrogance and conceit, now I'm looking down on these people and judging them for the way that they do things. I don't judge them for the way they're doing things. They're just doing things the way that they're doing them. And I'm bringing to their attention that the way that they are doing things are going to attract ants. They also attract the dogs because in Thailand there's a lot of stray dogs around and the dogs come in and they rummage through the trash and then they spread it out all over the hallway and then they have to clean that up afterwards and it's more work for them. But they're not seeing the challenge, obviously. They're not seeing the problem or or the issue. So they're continuing to do this. And I think that this is just the way they were brought up. They were probably brought up in the countryside where, you know, outside your door is probably dirt. You know, they probably grew up in a, a very rural area. And this is just the way that they did things. You know, and I grew up in, a, in another way. So it's not that I'm right and they're wrong or they're right and I'm wrong. It's just a difference of opinion. It's a different way of doing things. It's a disagreement in terms of I don't agree with how they do things. I wouldn't choose to do it that way. But that doesn't mean that I'm right and they're wrong. It's just a different upbringing, a different experience. And if I can bring some insight to them, if I can bring some wisdom to them based on my experiences, and they can see that it would be wiser to have the trash cleaned out, then maybe they will do that. But I suspect that they probably won't. Even before I even talk to them, I already know they probably aren't going to do it because I talked to them once before about three months ago when I first got back to Thailand after traveling to the USA and Egypt, they were doing this and I talked to them and then they cleaned it up and I think they left and and they were no longer living there. And then they must have come back at some point and I didn't realize it. And I started seeing all this trash accumulate. So you know, I'm not judging them and saying they're wrong. It's just a different viewpoint. It's just a different way of doing things in life. And that's where understanding the universal truth of impermanence is really helpful. And this is where understanding craving and anger and ignorance, this is where understanding the ego. Because if I went in there thinking that my way is the right way and everybody's got to do things my way, this is craving But this is also arrogance. This is also conceit, thinking that I'm so right and everyone else is so wrong. So when we come to a situation like this, if you get the conceit out of the way and just realize that this is impermanence, that I grew up one way, they grew up a different way. And of course, they're not going to do things the same way as I do them. And that doesn't mean my way is right and their way is wrong. It's just a different way. It's just impermanence. Well, so at the beginning of the journey to enlightenment, if one has a lot of hatred towards certain people and one is unable to cultivate love and kindness towards them, is it enough, at least at the beginning, to just eliminate hatred and then maybe later they will do the work to cultivate love or loving kindness towards them? Yeah, you know, the mind isn't going to go from hatred with this ill will and anger. It's not going to like be a switch where it goes and now all of a sudden you love them, right? It's going to be this gradual wearing away. The Buddha talks about this. I forget the type of tool, but it's like an axe, right? Like an axe handle. If you had an axe and you were chopping wood every single day, every single day, every single day, you wouldn't know how much wood was worn off of the handle of the axe. Each day, you wouldn't know how much wood got worn off of the handle. But when the handle is done and it can no longer be used and it needs to be replaced, you would know that. You would know when it's completely gone, but you wouldn't know how much of this wood on the handle was worn away every day. So same thing, when you're meditating and doing loving kindness and you're cultivating loving kindness in order to eliminate hatred, and anger and ill will, you're not going to know how much of the anger has been eliminated each day, 
but you'll know when it's completely gone because you'll no longer have hatred for this individual. So your mind's going to go from this hatred and it's going to just be gradually worn away, gradually worn away, gradually worn away, gradually worn away, gradually worn away. And then you might kind of feel a little bit neutral about the person for a while. And then you're gradually working up, gradually working up, gradually working up to more and more loving kindness. And now your mind's moving over here to the loving kindness. And now you know that the mind is loving and kind. I often talk about my mother, how when I first started the path, I had a hatred and anger, ill will towards my mom based on having resentment for things that happened in the childhood. And it took me six months to get to the point where that was pretty much eliminated. And now through that meditation, I was able to eliminate that. And my intention, speech and actions when I was around her became improved. And now we could have an improved relationship. But I didn't know each day how much of that anger had been eliminated. I only knew once it was completely eliminated because now I could be loving and kind and I never said a bad word to her. And I also wasn't hurt when she said bad things to me, right? So I didn't say anything bad to her. I I had eliminated all my anger and ill will. I'd eliminated all the craving. I'd eliminated any kind of ignorance towards speaking with wrong speech towards her. I had stopped doing that, but now she was still talking to me in negative ways, but I wasn't hurt by it. I just knew this is the way that she talks. And sometimes when she would start talking like that on the phone, I would say, well, mom, I can see that you're still working on talking more friendly and more polite. I'm gonna get off the phone now because I'm not interested in having a relationship like this. My relationship with you is more important that we preserve the friendliness and the politeness and the respect. I'm not interested in having our relationship go back to the way it was when there was a lot of anger and hatred. So I'm going to get off the phone and let you just think about what you are talking about and what you're discussing. And maybe we'll talk another time. And then sometimes I would go three months, six months, a year without talking to her. And then when we talked again, I noticed she would be more polite and more friendly and more respectful. Right. Because she realized that whenever she was being angry and hostile or bitter or belittling, David got off the phone and she knew that that right away I would get off the phone and then she gradually improved her conduct. So it took me transforming my mind, getting rid of the anger, hatred, ill will. It took me cleaning up my intentions, speech and actions towards mom so that I was no longer putting out any kind of hostility or aggression. It took me eliminating the craving for mom to be a certain way and have expectations for mom to be a certain way so that when she said things that were disrespectful or belittling, I didn't get hurt by it. I just knew that this was her problem. This is what she was working on. And then as I extinguished all of that, then gradually, slowly, but surely she extinguished the way that she was functioning. And then we could have a loving relationship. By the time she died, we had a a fine relationship where I would go to her house and help her with things and we would bring her food, all these different things. So it takes work, you know, it's not going to be one week and you're going to eliminate hatred that's been there for 10 years or 20 years. It's going to take a lot of work for you in meditation, but then also for you outside of meditation too. Well, so having hatred toward someone that there were some conflicts between them and us at some point in our life, this is understandable. But uh, a few hours ago, someone was talking to me. She told me that she, when she is uh, going upstairs, maybe uh, at her company, at her work, when she's seeing people going upstairs or downstairs, she feels perhaps a feeling or maybe a thoughts comes to her mind that she wants to push them, to cause harm to them. When I asked here, were there any any conflicts between you and them? She said, no, I have never seen them before. It's just a strong desire to cause harm to people. So I was thinking, why would the mind think in this way? This is because of the mental object ill will. There's mental object of ill will. So what I would guide the person in that situation is I would say, you know what? It's wonderful, first of all, that you didn't push them. That's outstanding. You restrained your mind. You didn't 
conduct yourself with a bodily action that's harmful. Number two, it's wonderful that you have mindfulness, that you observe that thought coming up. And then number three, you just need to cut that off and let it go and try to catch it sooner and sooner as just a bodily sensation so that then eventually if you cut it off enough times, it won't arise at all. But there's going to be a period of time, maybe months or or a year or two, who knows, where these thoughts are going to arise. And as long as you're aware that they're arising and you can cut it off and let it go, and you're not actually taking the action to push them, that's what you would like to do to be able to extinguish this. So this mental object of ill will that's in the mind, that's in there, who knows what she's experienced in her past. Maybe she was pushed downstairs in a previous life, who knows? We don't know that necessarily, but the fact is that right now, her mind is in such a condition that when she sees somebody, she's having this urge to push them, So there's some benefits there that she's not pushing them, that she sees the thought, she's restraining the mind and not doing it, and now she just needs to identify it quicker and quicker so that she can cut it off and let it go to the point where it will no longer arise. And then in the meantime, she needs to be using loving kindness meditation to break up this mental object of ill will so that while she's cutting off and letting go, of these thoughts that are arising as bodily sensations, she's at the same time trying to break up this mental object of ill will. And that's what will ultimately uproot it from the mind because she's now bringing in the loving kindness and getting rid of the ill will. Well, so if someone doesn't know about these teachings and perhaps is not willing even or not able to pick up a book or watch a video, So uh, I'm talking about someone, perhaps for me, my granddad or my grandmom. So if I noticed that they have hatred toward some person, some people, would it be wise to help them in this way? I sometimes try to ask them about the person that I know that they have hatred towards. When they start talking harshly about them, quickly I change the topic. They feel anger because I didn't allow them to suppress their hatred. So would this be a good way to help the mind stop showing anger towards some people? Potentially, but if you're cutting them off while they're talking, you're speaking at the wrong time. So you're not interested in cutting them off, but if they complete a sentence and then you change the subject, This can help them to cut it off, but you might also need to counsel them too and give them guidance. They need wisdom to know how to let this go. So I had these experiences with my grandparents growing up as well, where they would express certain hatred towards certain people or groups of people, and then I would talk to them. And I would say, well, why do you hate that person? You've never met that person. Why is it that you have the hatred towards them? They would say, well, you know, they're this, they're that, they're this, they're that. Well, how do you know you've never actually met them? Wouldn't it be much less of a burden for you if you just had love for them and kindness for them rather than having hatred? You know, I imagine carrying around that hatred is pretty heavy, isn't it? So sometimes you need to ask them questions in order to help them cultivate the wisdom and awaken the mind. Just cutting off and letting go isn't going to fully eradicate the hatred. They need to cultivate wisdom because remember the top problem of dependent origination is ignorance, the unknowing of true reality. So if you're just trying to cut off, cut off, cut off, cut off, and you're not taking the time to cultivate wisdom, then they're not going to experience improvement. They need the wisdom first. And then as you help them cultivate the wisdom and see the understanding of their thoughts and and why it would be unwise to have hatred. Now in subsequent conversations, maybe talk to them two, three, four times. Once they have the wisdom, now maybe you go to something like cutting it off and letting it go and trying to change the subject so that they can do that. So in these cases, would the practice generosity help the mind to let go of the, the, the holding on to this feelings or mental objects of uh, hatred? Yes. So, of course, the number one problem 
is the ignorance, the unknowing of true reality. And because of that, craving exists in the mind. And because of craving, then anger is going to arise. So in order to get rid of anger, you've got to start with wisdom, right? You got to start with wisdom and then you've got to eliminate craving. You've got to work on eliminating craving, which breathing mindfulness meditation and practicing generosity is helping that. And then that's going to mean there's less anger in the mind. So all of these three things are polluting the mind, craving, anger, and ignorance. And you're working on all three at the same time. And practicing generosity in general is going to help to let go of craving. But also in situations where somebody has anger towards a specific person, if they practice generosity with that person, if they can bring themselves to do that, it can actually help them to eliminate the anger towards that person. And if that person is angry at them, it can also help that person eliminate their anger too, because they see this generosity coming towards them. But you need to kind of look at this and observe this because sometimes if someone's overly angry and hostile and you practice generosity this can be unwise because it's almost rewarding them for their anger and hostility you would like to practice generosity when they're calm when they're showing you the conduct that is calmness and composure and that they're being friendly and respectful, that's a good time to practice generosity with them. Many thanks, teacher. That's all the questions for today. Okay. Well, I would like to thank all of you for joining for today's class. In our next class on Wednesday, we're going to be doing breathing mindfulness meditation together. On Saturday, we're doing the Pali Canon in English study group. We're in volume 13, chapters 31 through 40. And then in Sunday's class, We're going to be doing one of these specialized classes for the retreat series, which is titled Eliminating Personal Existence View, Getting the Self Out of the Way. This is the very first fetter that you would need to deeply understand and understand how to eliminate it in order to get into the first stage of enlightenment. There's three fetters to eliminate there. Personal existence view, wrong behavior and observances and doubt. And if you eliminate these three fetters, then your mind will move into the first stage of enlightenment where discontentedness will significantly diminish and the mind will not regress back lower than that. And then in the subsequent class after that on Sunday, I'm going to be going through all of the 10 fetters individually, explaining exactly what they are and exactly how to eliminate them. So this is the next two classes on Sundays, really focusing on on the 10 fetters. So this will be really helpful for a lot of people. So thank you all for joining. I would like to encourage you to continue to be dedicated and diligent in your meditation practice and building up your practice, continuing to meditate and attend classes, reading books and seeking guidance where you need help. So have a very lovely and wonderful rest of your day. We'll see you in a future class. Sawadee Thank you for listening to this podcast. To provide support for this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha. To access more teachings, visit buddhadailywisdom.com. There, you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Remember to establish a daily, consistent meditation practice, along with learning and practicing these teachings. A well-developed meditation practice is the foundation in which to train the mind to attain enlightenment.